Hi everybody, I'm comedian Michael McIntyre, host of hit BBC game show The Wheel, and welcome back to a long overdue volume of obscure and forgotten PS1 games, volume number 13 to be exact, a number that is unlucky for some, and considering the number of PAL exclusive games still floating about in The Wheel, a number that is likely unlucky for me too. Now for those who didn't watch the recent channel update video I put out, and let's be fair, who has time for that? The format is going to be changing somewhat in regards to the viewer choice portion of these episodes. Long story short, up until now I've been accepting all viewer submissions via comments, a system that has served me well but one that's quickly becoming more difficult to manage as the channel grows and as such starting from volume 21 we're going to be moving the viewer selection over to Patreon picks only. Now this was always going to be the end game for the viewer wheel since its inception but just to give all of you out there enough of a chance to have have your game selected before this new system comes into play, Volume 13 through to Volume 20 of both this series and Japan only PS1 games will all be viewer selections. And if you're yet to submit your own picks into the running, I will still be accepting viewer selections via the comments of these videos up until Volume 20. Now if you like, you can watch the channel update video for a more in-depth explanation behind all of this, but for now, that's enough of the boring stuff. Let's get on to the games, and we've got four juicy picks courtesy of this show's lovely viewers. And let me tell you, the wheel is primed and ready to provide. <laughs> Provide. Kicking things off today, we've got ourselves a little racing game, but not just any racing game, a racing game featuring tanks, aptly named, uh, Tank Racer. This game was chosen for the wheel by two fine folks going by the names of Container Core and Forever Craig, who I'm going to assume are some of my lovely pals from the PAL region because Tank Racer is yet again another PAL exclusive release on the console. Now you'd assume the rest of the world would probably enjoy racing around the countryside in tanks, but Alas, maybe we're in the minority. This game is a 1999 release that came to both PlayStations and home computers and is the first game from a studio known as Glass Ghost. Now interestingly, Glass Ghost was actually a subsidiary of a company by the name of Kuju Entertainment, a British studio with a pretty interesting history of game releases, bringing us licensed titles like Warhammer 40k Fire Warrior and Reign of Fire during the 6th gen, and also some deeper cuts like the Battalion Wars games over on Nintendo platforms, if anybody remembers them. Well, prior to being amalgamated into Kuju Entertainment as a whole, Glass Ghost was meant to be the label for their more mainstream releases, while Kuju would release their more traditional simulation games like Microsoft Train Simulator under another name called Simis. If this sounds very confusing, it's because it is. But all you need to know is Glass Ghost PS1 output was Tank Racer and also a 2000 release called Eagle One Harrier Attack, a game that may just appear in one of these videos down the line, but not today because it's Tank Racer time. Now you might already know that I'm a pretty big racing game fan and while nowadays I'm more interested in driving a souped up Toyota Supra with a sick spoiler, back in my youth there was nothing cooler than driving a tank, whether it was Micro Machines, GTA or that legendary cheat in Toka Touring Car Championship, you better believe if I could drive a tank, I'd be driving a damn tank. 
So it may come as a surprise to you that today is my first time playing Tank Racer. Well, technically that's not true since I did try it out briefly during one of my demo streams, but it is my first time playing the full version, so let's see what it's all about. Now Tank Racer is kind of an odd game. At its core, your goal is to simply just race around the track, complete three laps, and be in first place at the end. But of course, seeing as you're racing around in a vehicle with a big rotating turret, combat is also a big factor when it comes to winning. You have access to regular bullets that you can fire at your opponent by pressing the R1 button, and you can aim your turret by using the L2 and R2 buttons. Also, if you're wondering, you can't increase your speed by firing your cannon backwards. It is the first thing I tried in this game, and my sadness was immeasurable. But beyond the regular infinite weak bullets, the game also features a whole host of collectible pickups that function a lot like weapons in a kart racer. Some will trip up enemies behind you, some will protect you, some will speed you up, but most of them will wreck opponents ahead of you, which you love to see. So in many ways, we've got ourselves a fun combat heavy racer that's not too unlike kart racers of the era, but that's not what makes the game odd. It's more so the tanks themselves, because when you think of tanks, you think of big, heavy, slow machines of destruction, right? Well, the tanks in this game, while certainly capable of crushing cars and environmental objects, are actually quite light, or at least that's what they feel like while racing. These tanks are fast, they are loose, and they are also very, very bouncy, like they've got some sort of super suspension going on, which is also heightened by the tracks being full of bumps, dips, and various other terrain deformation, which makes the races actually quite dynamic and exciting. Don't expect any realistic tank controls where you have to worry about two treads simultaneously, although there is a mode you can unlock where you can. Note the default Racing in this game plays like any traditional racer of the time, where beyond shooting your opponents, the main thing you'll need to worry about is simply just navigating the track and occasionally pulling the odd handbrake turn from time to time. Gameplay wise, the movement feels quite unlike any other racer I've played. Now that's not to say it's bad, if I'm being honest I actually quite like how this game controls once I got used to it, but it's a, a very manic game at the best of times. Chaotic by design, if you will. Now moving on from the gameplay itself, the game has the usual array of modes you'd come to expect. Single races, time trials and some fun multiplayer options which include traditional and combat orientated races, but for the main single player content, we've of course got your tried and tested cup mode, which is split into three categories, bronze, silver and gold. Each tier features a series of races across a set list of tracks, and depending how you perform in said races, you'll get points and by the end if you're top of the leaderboard, you unlock the next tier and you do it all over again. The game features a total of 8 unique tracks that are reused throughout the Three cups, but each cup introduces new tracks and mixes up the race order to keep things fresh as the game goes on. Each cup also has its own roster of tanks to choose from, but that being said, they are all essentially reskins of the same four tanks, each of which prioritizes a specific strength. You've got the high speed tank, the high acceleration tank, the high grip tank, and the tank that's kind of good at everything. Oh yeah. Don't know why you wouldn't just pick this one, to be honest. Beyond the different stats and colour changes, there's really very little variety between the various tanks, unfortunately, but they do look nice in-game, at least. And speaking of visuals, I'd say across the board, Tank Racer is a pretty nice-looking PlayStation game. The eight tracks on offer take place in various locations around the globe, one of which even takes place on that smaller globe known as the moon. There's plenty of visual variety, day and night stages, and a bunch of environmental objects and set pieces for you to crush on your path. The visuals aren't always perfect, mind you. There is plenty of pop-in and some bothersome draw distance limitations, especially in the nighttime stages that can cause you some hassle if you're not used to the track's layout, but overall it's a nice colourful game that runs well and above all else features memorable track layouts with lots of good visual cues, which I think are important for racers of this style. Also, a nice feature is that the main menu has selectable wallpapers, which I really get a kick out of for some reason. As for the audio, well, it's a European racing game from 1999, and if you've watched enough episodes of this series, you should know what to expect really, and yes, it is a banger. Tank Racer delivers us yet another delicious platter of electronica of the era, with a particular focus on dub this time around. This game has some 
heavy, heavy bass running throughout its soundtrack. And while I'm already a fan of this style of music, it doesn't feel like it was shoehorned into this game to keep up with the trends of the time, and actually goes a long way to complement the chaos and carnage on screen. Sure, some heavy metal and hardcore would have been nice too, but we'd have to wait until the mid noughties for that kind of thing. So for now at least, Tank Racer gives us yet another low-key banger of a PS1 soundtrack, hidden within an obscure European racing game, as is tradition. Thankfully though, the game does give us a music player with a little visualizer, so you can enjoy the music outside of the races if you like. Although I'd probably just be happy chilling with the lovely main menu theme. So on the whole, we have a fun, arcadey, kind of silly racing game with solid fundamentals, a somewhat unique control style, and some great music. But and it's a big but. Tank Racer's Chaos is also somewhat of a double-edged sword because, my god, is this game difficult. Now difficulty in racers is a tricky topic because there's games that require a lot of driving skill and track knowledge, and Tank Racer is certainly one of those games. But on the other hand, Tank Racer is also a game where it feels like even though there are 8 racers vying for the top spot, it very much feels like it's 7 versus 1 because the AI in this game isn't so much interested in winning as it is making you lose. So allow me to explain. In each race you start in 8th position, and it's up to you to work your way up from the back to 1st place before the 3rd and final lap. Nothing unusual there. Although in each race, your opponent's tanks are spaced out just enough so that you only ever have to deal with one at a time. Once you get past one, move a little bit up the track, and then you're dealing with the next opponent. And this pretty much continues up until you're in first place. Now the issue with this is that your opponents never have to worry about any tank except you. Whenever you come across a tank, it's never focusing on the person ahead of it. It will turn its turrets backwards and focus only on you. And while this isn't too bad during the Bronze Cup, once you make it to the Silver Cup, you not only have to do some of these races perfectly, and I mean perfectly with every shortcut, but if you get bullied by an enemy tank or take a particularly bad shot from a special weapon, well, you might as well restart the whole tournament because you're not winning. It's like if you're playing Mario Kart, right? And you get stuck in a group of players in the middle who just keep hitting each other with weapons while the one guy up front gets a lucky break at the start and is so far ahead, they never need to worry about anything bar a blue shell. In Tank Racer, it's kind of like that, except there's no blue shell to balance it out. And if you get caught at any point, kiss first place goodbye. And this is just the silver cup. By the time you reach the gold cup, if you're lucky enough to get there, this whole thing becomes a serious problem where the AI racers are now cranked up to max difficulty and you gotta do 8 races in a row with practically zero mistakes, and let me tell you, with AI like this, well it's uh, it's not the most pleasant experience, let's just put it that way. Now even with these issues, I'd still say Tank Racer is a worthwhile and enjoyable experience overall. It's got fun tracks, fun racing, and plenty of unlockables to help with longevity, but it does kind of get held back from greatness thanks to some very unforgiving and oftentimes luck-based gameplay that will likely make most people tap out before they see everything it has to offer. It's the kind of game that I would like having in my collection just to whip out on occasion for the odd bit of silly fun or multiplayer shenanigans, but one that I'd rarely try to beat the completion because I'm, you know, not a masochist. Plus, if you do have the game, it will at least make for nice b-roll with your cats. So if any of you out there are in fact masochist, or maybe just someone who likes cool combat focused Euro racers with banging soundtracks, which, let's be fair, is probably a lot of you, well then you could certainly do a lot worse than this thing. You can't get too mad at a game that lets you race tanks on the moon now, can you?
you will provide. Next up, we have a little-known game by the name of Is No Good, and if you can believe it, it is yet again another PAL exclusive. It truly is my destiny to play them all, like some sort of 50 hertz Ash Ketchum. This game was chosen for the wheel by Acidonia150 Reborn, and let me tell you, this is the kind of game that will get you fast-tracked onto my list of enemies. Only joking, Acidonia, this is in fact a top-tier obscure pick for this episode, although for the lucky few who do know of its existence, they also probably know it for its reputation as one of the worst platformers on the system. And look, while admittedly I've not attempted to play through Bubsy 3D just yet, I have played through Cheesy and Santa Claus Saves the Earth, so I feel like I know what makes a truly bottom tier PlayStation platformer. So let's see if Is No Good lives up to his name and is in fact, eh. Uh, no Good. So, first things first, a little backstory. Is No Good is a French comic series that debuted in the 60s from artist Jean Tabari and writer René Goscinny, the same man responsible for the incredibly popular Asterix and Obelix. Although instead of warriors fighting the Roman Republic, Is No Good instead tells the tale of our titular character who is the Grand Vizier of the Caliph of Baghdad. The original comics were basically a series of shorts where Is No Good schemes to dethrone the Caliph but repeatedly fails to do so in numerous fashion, like some sort of Arab Looney Tunes written by French people. Needless to say, it somehow didn't reach the same heights of other French comics of the time. Although that's not to say that it still wasn't very popular, it was at least popular enough to get an animated series funded by Saban, the same studio behind the Power Rangers. I used to remember this show being on the kids channel we had back here over in the mid 90s called TCC, which was basically the channel for poor kids without satellite TV. Anyway, while I don't particularly recall enjoying the show, the intro theme was kind of a banger. He's no good, the Grand Vizier. He never wins, that much is clear. But watch out, Sultan, chances are. For him, there's no fight to bizarre. Sultan, he's Now you can say what you want about Saban, but my god did they know how to make an intro theme. And I suppose there's also the live action Is No Good movie that released in 2005, but that was supposedly so bad it killed any momentum the series had left, so there you go. So in between the cartoon and the very bad live action movie, we also got Is No Good The Video Game, a 1998 release for both PlayStation and home computers. And as you can imagine, this French game was both published and developed by a French company, and not one with a history of good games like Ubisoft or Infograms, but also not Cryo, thankfully. Nope, instead we've got a game from Microids, a name that you might remember all the way back from Volume 3 of this series, where we took a look at a game called Invasion, a pretty janky but ultimately rather enjoyable space shooter that left me interested in trying a few more of their games, because from what I knew prior to this, Microids similarly to Cryo had a reputation for a uh, some bizarre and poorly made PlayStation games, and well, all I can say is that after playing Is No Good, I think I now see where that reputation comes from. So Is No Good, at its core, is your traditional 90s 2D platformer, although since it's from Europe, it's got all the stuff that you'd come to expect from our regional takes on the genre. Non-linear levels, tons of items to collect, some of which are mandatory, switches hidden throughout the levels that need to be activated to progress further through the levels, enemies coming at you from every direction imaginable, some of which you can jump on, some of which you can't. Also, hit detection that is all over the place, parts of the environment which are impossible to tell if you can jump on or can't jump on. There's also blind leaps of faith and even bottomless pits that drain all your lives immediately for some reason. It's, uh, you know what? Actually, everything in this game is quite bad, really. Well, not everything, but yeah. 
mostly everything. Anyway, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, the plot in this game is pretty much what you see in the bizarre opening cutscene. Is no good wants to be Sultan instead of the Sultan, and so we go on a quest to do that by going through 14 levels set in increasingly bizarre locations. I'm not exactly sure how we go from Iraq to space, but there are seemingly cutscenes to help bridge the gap, but they are very short and usually leave you with more questions than answers. Safe to say, this is yet another case of video games. Don't worry about it. We don't have to give it much thought. I'm sure we've all been shrunk down to the size of an ant on occasion. If it can happen to Parappa the Rapper, it can happen to anybody. So the game moves in a linear fashion from one level to the next, with your goals in each level being to make it to the end before time runs out, kill a boss enemy, and also to collect enough gold coins so you can meet the quota shown to you before the level starts. All of these tasks are quite manageable, thankfully. It's just the process of doing them is, a. Uh very, very bad. Now, I'd imagine most people who play Is No Good are probably going to figure out that it's kind of a shit show within the first few seconds of playing it, and that's not taking into account all the issues we listed previously, which could be manageable if the game at least played well, but holy moly, does this game not play well. First off, the control mapping in this game, for whatever reason, they made the jump button square and the run button X. A combination so bizarre that my PlayStation muscle memory quite literally could not get used to it during the entire playthrough. So much so that all the footage you're seeing here should be of just me jumping randomly 95% of the time because my brain couldn't comprehend it. This issue was made even worse because your attack button, which is throwing money by the way, or a bomb or dynamite if you find them, that attack button is locked to the circle button. So if you're holding your thumb down on the X button to run and using the top of your thumb to tap the square button to jump, it's almost impossible to comfortably access the circle button to attack. Now, I know it may not sound like a big deal without trying it out for yourself, but it really does feel so incredibly awkward and cumbersome in execution. And there's also no way to remap the controls in this game either. So you just gotta deal with it. Now, if you're playing this on an emulator, you could remap the controls, but I've got to experience this thing as intended, and let me tell you, it intends for you to have a bad time. Although beyond these controller issues, the actual player movement itself, even worse somehow. Is No Good's general movement is okay for the most part. There's no weird momentum, he doesn't move too fast while running. All that stuff is fine. But the moment you get Is No Good into the air, things begin to quickly fall apart. Firstly, Is No Good not only has fall damage if you fall from too great a height, but if you fall for too long, you get locked into a fall animation that sends you uncontrollably straight down into the ground. And this animation happens after you've fallen for a very short amount of time. So in other words, in a jump heavy platformer, this is gonna happen to you a lot. And it fucking sucks. Although the thing that truly annoyed me most in this game is that upon landing from any jump, Is No Good immediately ceases all momentum and enters a short animation. Now imagine if you were playing Mario and every time you landed a jump, you had to stop in place for half a second. Character momentum and movement are, I think, probably the most crucial part of a platformer, especially when it comes to 2D entries in the genre. This right here feels like it was made by people who have never played a platformer before. And keep in mind, this game came out in 1998. Think about how many good 2D platformers they had available as inspiration. I think the closest thing Is No Good compares to is like some sort of nightmare Donkey Kong Country, except the fun, tightly designed gameplay and platforming is reverse engineered to make you miserable. For example, Is No Good has an underwater level, and look, contrary to popular opinion, I love a good underwater stage. I even like the underwater levels in Croc, would you believe? But once again, Is No Good just has to be weird about the whole thing, and only allows you to swim upwards when you cease all horizontal movement, just taking any fun out of the act of simply just exploring the level. Not that the level design made it very much fun to begin with. So anyway, I think I've established Is No Good doesn't control very well, and while that is my biggest issue with the game, even if it did play well, it still has plenty of other issues to overcome. I suppose we'll start with the enemies. Levels are littered with them, and whether you are high in the sky or slumming it down below, they will find you 
and they will stun lock you. Now some enemies can be killed by jumping on their heads, some will instead bounce you and others will just give you damage. There's no obvious visual cues on these enemies to let you know what they will do, so just jump on everything and hope for the best really. Although if you prefer, you can kill enemies by using your aforementioned ranged attack, which you can swap to be gold, bombs or dynamite that you find throughout the levels. Now since you need to collect gold coins to beat the level, you're probably best holding on to them even though they are pretty abundant throughout. In fact, you're probably best off holding onto all your ammo entirely for the boss fights which show up at the end of most levels. Now these boss fights, whether it's the first boss or the final boss, are all fundamentally the same fight, where all you gotta do is spam ranged attacks at a slightly chunkier enemy until it eventually falls down. There were many times that I didn't even realise these guys were bosses and that should tell you all you really need to know about them. In fact, if there was one real boss in this game, I'd say it's actually the time limit, which is quite strict really. And considering most of the levels require you to search high and low for switches to move on through the level, and you know you've also got to deal with all that, uh player movement, well some levels you might find are pretty tight on time. Now, there are thankfully pickups you can get to extend the time, but even then you can often find yourself cutting it really, really close. One occasion in particular, the time ran out after I had killed the boss, but for some reason it took multiple seconds for the level to end after killing it, so I failed and had to go back to the beginning. It's funny right, because Is No Good itself isn't actually all that difficult. On the default setting, you can take 6 hits before losing a life, and thankfully, losing a life doesn't actually restart the level, it rather just spawns you on the spot, ready to start again. And worst case scenario, if you do lose all your lives, you just begin the level again with all your lives back, so you more or less have infinite continues and a password system if you, for some reason, wanted to keep playing this thing past the first level. So what this means is that, for the most part, you can really just brute force your way through the majority of the enemies in this game as long as you find the odd health or life pickup along the way. And this is true for all the platform levels and the two odd racing levels which, while also very bad, are probably the best part of the game really. However, just make sure that you don't fall into a pit while playing as instead of damaging you or costing you a life, it just instantly restarts the level again which is a... Uh great. But you know what, that's enough of me whining about the gameplay. I think it's time we talked about the game's presentation, which, while also full of issues, does thankfully feature some bright spots as well. Very minor bright spots, but, you know, we, we gotta be nice when possible. So to the game's credit, I don't necessarily hate how it looks. Is No Good features a lot of visual variety across the 14 levels, and these levels can feature some very colourful and imaginative background, sporting this very nice cartoony and, I guess, paint-like look. They are all pretty low res, mind you, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy a lot of what I saw. Although this graphical style would unfortunately end up being a thorn in my side, because this is one of those games where it's impossible to read what you can and can't interact with in the environment. Is this a platform? Is this a wall? Is this a doorway? Oftentimes the answer is yes, but oftentimes the answer is also no, and well, you're just gonna have to figure these things out the hard way most of the time. Now this can become a big bother later in the game where you need to enter into hidden rooms and doorways which can very easily just be mistaken for the game's background. It's particularly bad in one of the end game levels called the Enchanted Forest, easily one of the messiest and most cluttered levels I have ever experienced in a video game. The occasionally cool and imaginative imagery is just overshadowed by how much random crap is everywhere all the time. The character models are also nice on occasion but most of the time they just look kind of odd and out of place with the backgrounds. Also, check out some more of the game's cutscenes. They are truly a sight to behold. <laughs> It's no good, oh detestable vizier. I thank you for having set me free from this prince charming. And to show my gratitude, I'm offering you a magic wand. So this brings us on finally to sound and music, which frankly is also kind of a mixed bag. First off, the sound effects absolutely abysmal, as cheap and stock sounding as they come. This game in particular really loves overusing that stock children laughing sound effect in some of the most bizarre situations. I'm sure you know the one I'm talking about. <laughs> and I'm sure as you can hear, the game is also mixed terribly too, with the sound oftentimes abruptly cutting out mid-level and during cutscenes. It is very, very bad. Ha 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 ha.
Also, check out this boss fight. Amazing. Although somehow, against all odds, the music in this game is, uh, not that bad. It's more, uh, weird than good, I would say, but weird is easily better than everything else this game has going for it, so... I'll take it. You see, the game has these rather catchy and well-made compositions, ones that often fit the themes of the levels quite nicely too, but almost every track in this game has some sort of weird effect, addition, or vocal cue that just gives off a kind of strange vibe, actually. You know, listening back to some of them here, I actually think I enjoy them a little bit more than I remember, but it could also just be because I'm not playing the game right now, so that might also help. Have a listen and see for yourself. <laughs> So all in all, Is No Good took me a little over an hour and a half to beat its 14 levels, and I can safely say, I think this might be the worst platformer on the console. Is No Good somehow manages to take all the worst things about 90s 2D platformers and somehow squeezes it all into a single PlayStation disc, and let me tell you, it is very, very bad. It's so bad that it somehow made me fondly remember Cheesy because for all that game's faults and weird quirks, you could learn to adapt to them and get a mild bit of enjoyment out of it. Is no good, on the other hand, from the second you begin to move in this game, you'll realize you made a mistake ever putting it in your console. And after personally enduring the experience from start to finish, trust me, it only gets worse never better. So maybe one day in the future when I eventually settle down to play Bubsy 3D once and for all, I can give my true de facto opinion on what the worst platformer on the PS1 is, but something tells me if you play this thing, it'll make some of you view Bubsy 3D in a softer, kinder light. So for Bubsy's sake, maybe give this game a try. Otherwise, I'd recommend just pushing it far away with a 10-foot barge pole attached to another 10-foot barge pole. Seriously though, the game does actually radiate a negative aura, so you're gonna wanna keep it far away. provide It's me. Alex! You the only one left? I don't know. I'm the only one who made it from our unit. <laughs> so managed to survive, huh? You deserve a reward for that. And here it comes. <laughs> Michelle! Our 
hard edge. Coming up next, we have something that will hopefully wash the taste of is no good from our mouths. It's Hard Edge, aka TRAG, Tactical Rescue Assault Group, Mission of Mercy in North America. Quite the name change, I must say. This game was chosen for us today by KM and Larry Kawaska, and interestingly, both of these fine folks had games picked in the Japan only series before, making them the combined first ever two time winners on the channel. You love to see it. Hard Edge is another game from Sunsoft, who you might remember from their last appearance in the series with the game Hebereki's Popoito, which, uh, was most certainly a video game. Hebereki's Popoito? Huh? Sunsoft was a pretty big name back in the NES era, known for their high quality titles and banging soundtracks. See, Batman, Blaster Master, or Mr. Gimmick for reference. In the PS1 days, however, things were a little more low key for Sunsoft releases, especially in the West, but every now and then the odd Sunsoft game would make its way over to our shores, and today's entry, Hard Edge, a late 1998 release, is definitely one of the more interesting entries in their back catalogue. What we have here is essentially a non horror take on a Resident Evil style tank control adventure game. Replace the scares, survival elements and dark moody environments with a futuristic office, beat em up gameplay where you mercilessly dunk on robots and even some bossa nova lounge jazz in the background too help lighten the mood. Now going by my own personal taste, that all sounds like a winning combination, and while this here is my first time ever playing this game, it is a game that I've wanted to try for a very long time, all the way back to when I first read about it in a magazine as a kid. Now it was probably all down to the cool and memorable characters really, I just love a low poly dude with spiky hair, you know? I'm only human. So before we dig into the gameplay, let's talk a little bit about the plot. In the far off future of 2046, a terrorist cell has taken over the Togusa building, and it's up to the members of the Tactical Rescue Assault Group to save the day. Of course, as does often happen in fictional office terrorist scenarios, things don't exactly go to plan, leaving only two members of the team, Alex and Michelle, left alive trapped inside the building with no way to communicate with the outside world. And there you go, that's where the game begins with you either controlling Alex or Michelle on your quest to save the day. Now what makes this game quite interesting is that similar to some other games in the genre, there are multiple playable characters that alter how the game is played. But the big gimmick here is that you can swap freely between your characters at any time. Each character has their own separate health bars, fighting styles and special abilities, and while you begin the game with just Alex Alex and Michelle initially, shortly into your playthrough you'll also come across two additional playable characters as well, a cyborg named Rachel and a big beefy boy detective named Burns, who is a complete himbo and also coincidentally my favourite character in the game. The story naturally takes a number of twists and turns with both Burns and Rachel offering more insight into everything that's going down within the tower. Now without spoiling too much, all you really need to know is that the game is about on par with what you'd come to expect from early examples of the genre, that is to say it's wacky, campy and very very cheesy but, you know, in the best possible way. Sure the translation isn't without the odd error here and there but it's a fun story from start to finish and of course most importantly it also has some top tier bad voice acting too and I gotta say considering how funny the delivery of some of these lines are I'm surprised this game isn't more well known because this stuff is absolute gold. So the troublesome little mice appear on the scene again. Miguel. I'm honored you remember my name. I detest liars. Hand over the disc and I promise I shall release the professor. Anyway, onto the gameplay itself and well, if you've played a tank control action game on the PlayStation, well, you'll probably know how this thing plays. Walk with the D-pad, hold the X button to run, circle to interact with things, all that good stuff. Although notably there is no quick turn button in this game, something it probably really could have used, but hey, we'll let it slide. Although with Hard Edge, where things begin to change from the norm is in its combat and inventory management. And I suppose we'll start with the inventory management in that they're, uh, is none. While there are plenty of items to pick up in this game, your inventory is both bottomless and shared across all four of your characters. If you need to use an item on something, assuming that you have it in your inventory, it will be selected automatically. If you need to heal, simply select from your healing items with the shoulder buttons and then press triangle to use it in the field. Want to change ammo for your gun? It's the same process, just tap the shoulder button 
and well, you're reloaded and good to go. Wanna save? Well, all you gotta do is reach a terminal and you can save for free. No items required. As you can see, this clearly isn't a game about resource and inventory management. While it clearly shares a lot of the DNA of survival horror games on the console, this is really more of an action-focused take on that style of game. Less time in menus, more time punching robots, you know? Now that's not to say that you won't ever use menus. You will often find special items that let you give a character a permanent health buff that can only be used within menus. Plus there are notes that you can find in the environment and uh, the map as well. And trust me, you're gonna be looking at this a lot. But beyond the lack of survival elements, the combat is the other thing that sets it apart from others in the genre. Now, I'm unlucky enough to say that I'm quite familiar with hand-to-hand -hand combat systems in tank control, static background games, and let me tell you, it was some hard times. And while I haven't played every single game in this style during this wonderful experimental time in video gaming, I'm looking at you, perfect weapon and time commando, I can safely say that Hard Edge is the best playing take that I've seen on this style yet. And that's not to say it's amazing or even quite good, but it is competent and oftentimes quite fun, and believe me, that's a far cry from what I'm used to. Now as mentioned before, each of the characters have their own fighting style and weaponry that affects how they play. Alex is the only character that uses a gun and of course favours long range attacks. Michelle is a nice balanced character with a good combination of strength and speed. Rachel is the fastest and potentially most deadly character, but also the one with the lowest health. And finally Burns, as mentioned, is a big beefy boy, meaning he is slow and tanky, but if you manage to get one punch off with this guy, it's lights out for most regular enemies. Dynamite! Like I said, clearly the best character. All your attacks are executed with the square button, but inputting a direction while pressing the attack button allows different moves and combos to be performed. There's not a huge amount of these attacks per character, but between the four of them, it does allow for a lot of flexibility throughout the game, and choosing the right character for the right segment will make things a whole lot easier easier for you as the game progresses. Another important part of the combat system is the lock on button. If you hold down the OR1 button, you will lock on to the nearest enemy. Now, this is very handy because it allows you to automatically face enemies even while moving, which definitely comes in handy for the game's faster foes. And it's also pretty much mandatory when playing as Alex, as your shots will almost always miss your opponent if you don't press the lock on button first. So yeah. Lock on is your friend. Now, truthfully, you could probably just run past most of the combat situations in this game if you like, since enemies only really just drop ammo or health pickups, and you are going to be pretty well stocked up with ammo and health in this game, believe me. But that being said, at least it is still fun to beat stuff up in this game, and since the game gives you so much ammo, you might as well have a good time. Honestly, the whole thing really just feels like somebody true Resident Evil and a beat em up in a blender. It's a weird combination that probably shouldn't quite work, yet it kinda does, even if the combat is admittedly quite simple at its core. It even has the tried and tested AoE attack that takes away a little bit of your health when you use it, so as you can see, it truly is a beat em up at heart. Now combat is of course only one part of the game, and not even the main part really. The main part is exploring the Togusa building. Lots and lots of exploring. You know the drill by now, it's up to you to search all the rooms for items and information, which in turn might help you access more rooms, which will then lead you to further items and more information, and so on and so forth. And while Hard Edge does simplify this process to a degree, you're still gonna spend a huge portion of this game looking for ways to progress further. Long story short, it's just a case of interacting with pretty much everything and you'll usually find what you need. And this is something you're probably gonna do all the time anyway, since this is how you find usable health items in the game and they are quite literally hidden everywhere. Something that makes this formula more enjoyable though, is that at the beginning of the game, your characters decide to split up to check separate floors of the building and you can pick which character to send to which floor. Now you can still swap between characters at any time, but each of you is confined to a specific floor and to progress through the game, you're each gonna need to complete specific objectives, which in turn will make new areas available for your characters on the other floor. So if you reach a dead end with one character, swap over to the next and see what you can accomplish up here. The initial choice also changes who meets up with the other playable characters, leading to exclusive scenes and events to help give the game a bit more replayability. Now you do all reunite further into the game and you're gonna still need to use specific characters to solve certain sections. Alex, for example, is the only member of the team with night vision goggles, so he'll need to be used whenever things get a little bit dark for the crew. Need to squeeze into somewhere small? Well then, Rachel is your best friend. Or if you need to move something big and heavy, well then you just select your resident himbo. Michelle, on the other hand, uh, doesn't have any special abilities, but she does have a cool kick attack. 
so that's nice. Another thing that you'd come to expect from a game like this are puzzles, and while the game does have the usual array of safes and number pads to unlock, puzzle-wise there's really not a lot here, and what is here is rarely challenging either. Sometimes you gotta tap a few buttons, you might need to check the bottom of a bomb to disarm it. Hard Edge isn't exactly the most mentally taxing or exciting game when it comes to puzzles, but I will say they were never frustrating or felt like they halted my progress throughout my playthrough. Honestly, if anything, the game as a whole is quite easy really. Enemies rarely put up much of a challenge and ammo and healing items are super plentiful. If anything, the only real difficult part of the game for me was the bosses, which in turn were also the highlight. The game has about 6 bosses in total, some of which are kind of annoying, others are stupidly easy, but I'd say the majority of bosses in this game put up quite a fight and have some fun and interesting attack patterns too. The late game bosses especially, you're going to want to have some health items stocked up for these guys, because they can take you out very, very quickly if you're not prepared. Now all this being said, there are still a few issues I had with the game, which kind of hampered my enjoyment of it somewhat. Now, it's nothing deal breaker worthy, but it's stuff that I still think is probably worth highlighting all the same. For one, the movement in this game feels a little bit off, almost like the turning arc for your character is a bit too wide. It's a little tricky to explain, but it made precise movement rather difficult at times, not to mention I would often get caught up on parts of the environment way more than I'd probably like to admit. I know some of you probably think this is just, you know, tank controls, but Trust me, I know top tier tank controls and hard edges, while serviceable, are also far from perfect. Another issue I had was the environments themselves. Now, we'll talk more about the visual design in a moment, but in regards to exploration, Hard Edge is a game with a lot of similar looking areas and locales. Locales that admittedly look quite nice, but ones that are actually very difficult to navigate through because it can at times all feel like it just blends together. If you ever need to return to a specific room, actually remembering where that room was and on what floor kind of be a little bit tricky to recall. Now the handy map does make this a whole lot easier, but even with a map, there were plenty of times I had to stop and go, wait, where am I? Another thing that kind of bothered me, and this might just be down to the way that I play these games, is that almost every single thing in this game, if you interact with it, it's going to give you a little text pop-up. Now these text pop-ups aren't skippable, and they also take a few seconds to disappear whenever they're triggered. Now if you're hunting for items in this game, which you're probably going to do, you've got to interact with everything. And I'd say a good half hour of my game time, was probably just looking at these random text boxes. They're not too long and bothersome enough to be a deal breaker, but just long enough to be mildly annoying each time you trigger one. And believe me, I've triggered a whole lot of them. So yeah, my issues with Hard Edge, hardly anything that stopped it from being a fun experience overall, but there's still things that are frequent enough to kind of hold it back from truly being a shining example of the genre, you know? Although, if there's one thing I have to praise Hard Edge for, it's the game's presentation. Even though I just mentioned the game's environments and backgrounds can cause some navigational issues, I really love the way this game looks. It has this lovely clean cyberpunk aesthetic, and while the plot of the game kind of makes it seem like anime diehard in a way, the game's environments actually remind me a lot of the Shinra building from Final Fantasy VII. Imagine a Resident Evil game that takes place in here and well, that's the vibe that this game radiates. Also, I'm just saying, this game happens to feature a spiky haired protag and the first boss is a giant red robot scorpion. Probably just a coincidence, but you never know. Naturally, the backgrounds are all quite low resolution as you'd expect, especially since it's a single disc game, but there is a lot of detail in each and every room, and the areas that stand out really stand out. Although the highlight for me are probably the character designs and models themselves. Throughout every cutscene or even just the menus, you can see how much personality these characters exude, and thankfully they manage to look great in-game too, whether they're running around the environments, engaging in combat, or simply just pushing a box. Also, that's got to be the nicest looking box in PS1 history. Seriously, what kind of black magic is this? The enemies and bosses are also suitably cool. Big, chunky robot security guards, terrorists, mutants, and uh, cyberspace mind viruses. All the usual stuff is here. The game's antagonists are all also delightfully extra and as over the top as you'd hope for in a game like this. Frankly, the game on a visual level is a big win for me across the board. It may not be the most impressive on a technical level compared to some of the heavy hitters in the genre, but it's got a style and flair all the 
its own that does make it stand out in the console's library for sure. Sound wise, the game is also firing on all cylinders too. The sound effects are great and as we highlighted before, the voice acting here easily transcends into so bad it's good territory, something that just improves the overall experience immeasurably. <laughs> is it now? I must admit you've impressed me by making it this far. But don't be too cocky, you haven't seen my true form yet. And the good thing with Sunsoft is that it's usually a safe bet to expect good things on the music front, and while I wouldn't exactly classify Hard Edge's soundtrack as full banger territory, it does manage to feature catchy tunes for almost every single scenario, whether that means you're just wandering around the office building or engaging in a serious story cutscene. It's rare to have a moment in this game where you're not bopping your head along to the music, and considering the type of game that this is, it's actually impressive they managed to include such a varied soundtrack that's at times playful and easy going and also rather intense and menacing. So in the end, it took me roughly about 4 hours to be hard edge on my first playthrough, although it's definitely one of those games where if you know the optimal routes and where exactly you need to go, you could easily mop this one up in far less time, and that's something you may want to do, because not only does beating this game unlock you new outfits and even some new weapons that can alter combat, but in my case, I also got the bad ending of the game, and I won't delve into how I got this ending, but I'd say most people will probably get the bad ending on their first playthrough without trying, so it's a good thing the game offers up some fun changes for repeat playthroughs. But the important question remains, did Hard Edge manage to live up to my lofty childhood expectations based on some magazine screenshots from back in the day? Uh, yeah, actually. This game was pretty much exactly what I expected it to be, an action-heavy Resident Evil clone. And honestly, one of the biggest reasons that I wanted to play this game, besides the cool character designs, is because it was a non-horror take on the genre. Look, I won't lie to you, I love horror games as much as the next guy, but I'm also kind of a coward. Hard Edge, while not particularly excelling at any one thing, manages to give you a more lighthearted take on that Resident Evil formula, and if you're a fan of this style of game, but maybe want to avoid the panic and stress that can oftentimes be caused by them, well, Hard Edge is the solution. Don't expect its combat or puzzle solving to rock your world, but do expect a competent game with lovable, likeable characters, all of which are fun to play as, cool boss battles, lovely visuals, and some great music. And well, I think that makes this a game well worth trying. It can be kind of pricey to pick up nowadays, but I personally had enough fun with it to make it something that I'd want to have in my own collection to play through again. And it's definitely not just something I bought because I needed another excuse to show off my cats. Come on now. That would be stupid. And here it is, an order made Burns bomb with anchovies and extra cheese. I think you'll find this will blast through that baby like a knife through butter. <laughs> you will provide.
rounding things out today, we have our final pick of Volume 13, and that's Treads of Faith, aka Do Prism, if you live in Japan. This game was chosen for the wheel by yet another duo, this time comprising of High Retro Game Lord and RJ Mario 22, and I suppose that's rather fitting, as Treads of Faith is very much a game about duos, and You'll see why in a moment. So first things first, Treads of Fate comes from a little known studio by the name of Squaresoft who is mostly known for making Rad Racer on the NES and then some other stuff as well. Originally released in Japan in October 99 under the name Do Prism before making it to North America in the summer of 2000 as Treads of Faith, this right here is a light-hearted action RPG in the vein of other Squaresoft titles like Brave Fencer Musashi and similarly to Brave Fencer Musashi, this is another Squaresoft title that unfortunately didn't make it over to PAL regions. They probably just thought we were too busy with all our racing games and uh bad platformers. So for me personally, despite being a big fan of Square's output during the era, Treads of Faith has always kind of just remained a mystery to me. Now, that's not to say I wasn't aware of the game, I always remember the box art at least, mostly because this guy's wearing a weird hat and I often mistook him for another Square character who has an even weirder hat and some other things going on. But as for the game itself, yeah, I'm pretty much going into it blind, and since it's a PS1 era Squaresoft title, well, my expectations are pretty high, so let's see how things turn out. Now, there's a lot that can be said about this game's plot and characters, trust me, a lot. But for now, all you need to know is that the game centers around two different playable characters, a boy named RuPaul and a girl named Mint. Both of these characters are uh, very different personality-wise, but each of them shares a common goal, that being to obtain a powerful relic hidden somewhere near the town of Corona. And I suppose the gimmick of this game is that you can choose to play as either Ru or Mint and experience this tale from two very different perspectives. The characters that you'll meet, the enemies you fight, and the majority of places that you'll visit will be the same across each playthrough, but the dialogue, your motivations, and more importantly, the combat change up depending on who you're playing as. We will revisit the story in good time, but for now, Let's dive into the actual gameplay here in Treads of Faith, which is mostly broken up into two sections. Story segments, where you wander around talking to various characters, and action segments, which feature combat, platforming, dungeons, plenty of puzzles, and more boss fights than you can shake a big dragon at. The game operates out of a central hub located in the town of Corona, which lets you access the usual array of inns, taverns, and churches, but from here you can also simply select any of the game's levels or zones, and there you go, you're straight into the Action. It's a nice formula really, you get a series of cutscenes and some story progression which will then lead you to unlock a new location and once you visit that location and beat a boss, you then return to the town to do it all over again. It's simple, but it works quite well. But what about the action gameplay you ask? Well, even though Rue and Mint each have their own special skills that make them unique, they do share a lot of the same basic abilities. Each character has access to a tree hit combo, which handily also refills your mana bar on hit, we'll uh, talk more about that shortly, and each character also has a jump attack, and unsurprisingly they can also jump at will too, which is uh, quite helpful for the whole jump attack thing. But let's ignore those basic abilities for now, because it's the special abilities that really make these characters fun. Rue has the ability to transform into many of the game's enemies and also gain unique attacks and abilities while in these forms. You can do this by simply picking up coins that are dropped off dead enemies and these transformations aren't just helpful in combat, you'll also need to utilize certain abilities to help pass obstacles and solve puzzles as well and believe me, there are a lot of these transformations, some definitely more useful than others but I appreciate the ambition you know. As for Mint, well, she's a talented magician, which means we get magic, and the magic system in this game absolutely rules. Mint has access to seven different elements that can also be combined with seven different techniques, each of which is its own spell with varying power, special effects, and magic costs, and my god, are these fun to use. I mean, you practically start the game out with a machine gun. Oh yeah, and I suppose you can also use the magic and varying elements to solve different puzzles, but I mean, come on, seriously. A holy machine gun, you know what I mean? Boat Rue and Mint's abilities can be swapped at any time by using this handy wheel that's brought up by holding the square button, allowing you to briefly pause time and then get right back into the action once you're ready to go. Really, the gameplay here, whether you're playing as either Rue or Mint, can oftentimes feel like a beat em up or platformer as much as a traditional action RPG. In fact, I'd say this is probably the closest I've felt to playing a Squaresoft take on a PS1 era platformer because the usual RPG elements 
elements while present kind of take a back seat or are just simplified to an extent. For example, while the game does have stats, there's no traditional leveling system. You have health and mana bars, but health increases through taking damage and mana increases by simply using spells. There are items that you can find, but they're mostly just for selling and the money that you get can be used to buy simple flat increases to your attack and defense, and for the most part, that's about it really. There are no item shops or even item menus to use things like potions or ethers. All your recovery pickups come from being dropped by enemies, and the only other major items that you can collect are these various coins, which basically just act as extra lives, meaning if you die, you can use a coin to restart at a checkpoint with a certain amount of mana recovered, depending on the rarity of the coin you use. Long story short, you're going to spend a lot more time playing this game and digesting the story than simply fiddling through menus. Although while the gameplay here is a lot of fun, it also isn't without its issues as well, which I think largely come down to some of the game's systems lacking a bit of refinement, namely the combat and the platforming. Combat, to its credit, is fast and snappy, which is mostly thanks to a simple auto lock-on system, making it easy to stick to enemies in the middle of combat. Although, this auto lock-on system can also make you switch to different targets mid-fight, resulting in you often turning your back to enemies or even attacking in the direction of bottomless pits, which uh, goes about as well as you'd expect. The game also lacks a block or dodge function, which while not exactly necessary, did make the combat feel a bit less fluid, since most of the time you'll probably just end up jumping away from enemies as your only option to avoid attacks. Although probably the single biggest shame is that Rue's creature abilities are just nowhere near as fun or useful as Mint's magic system. For the most part, the strongest form of Rue is, well, just Rue. The best option for 90% of his playthrough is just to play as the guy himself, as some of the other creatures have terrible attacks, terrible mobility, and also terrible abilities, and are just gonna mostly put you at a disadvantage. There are some notable exceptions, like the late game Jin, who just bodies everything it touches, but outside of the times that you'll need specific creatures to solve puzzles, the monster system just feels like a missed opportunity that you'll likely only really utilize when necessary rather than, you know, actually wanting to use it. Mint, on the other hand, while still suffering from the same lock-on and limited movement options, is just so much more fun to play as. These magic abilities are a blast to use and actually elevate the combat gameplay a few steps above Ruse in my opinion. And while similarly to him, there's likely a few spells that you won't bother with or utilize much during your playthrough, the fact that there's so many of them and the majority are really, really cool and useful, well, it made combat a constant joy, even with the odd issues. On the other hand though, the platforming, Definitely not one of this game's strongest suits. Now look, to be fair, the platforming in this game is quite serviceable. Your characters have a basic jump with a good degree of air control. The issue more so I found came down to some rather twitchy character movement. Movement which is good on the ground than when moving through environments, but when it comes to narrow platforms that have very small margins for error, eh, it's not so hot. It's something that you will learn to adapt to, and what platforming is here, won't really trouble you too much, except for this one bit. And I know if you've played the game, you hated this part too, but we're not going to dwell on it. Overall, the gameplay here is fun, easy to pick up, and immediately satisfying, something that remains a constant throughout, but it is just missing that extra bit of refinement to turn it from something quite good into something truly excellent. And well, when it comes to Squaresoft on the PS1, you kind of have the expectation for excellence, you know? And I suppose, in spite of the gameplay not being one of Squaresoft's highlights on the system, I'd still say Treads of Fate exudes the charm and warmth that you'd come to expect from this company at its peak. The way Treads of Fate wins you over isn't with its gameplay, it's with its stunning visuals, its beautiful soundtrack, and most importantly of all, its characters. You see, as I mentioned earlier, the plot in this game centers around Rue and Min seeking out an ancient relic. Rue's motivation for seeking out the relic is that he believes it can help bring back the woman he loves after she was brutally murdered in front of his eyes by a strange warrior, while Mint, a rogue princess, is simply seeking out the relic because she wants to achieve global domination by any means necessary. She's also one of the funniest characters 
ever put in a video game. While the end goal is essentially the same for each character, you're effectively choosing to experience the perspective of a loyal amnesiac hero crippled by guilt and despair who will stop at nothing to win back his girl, or the literal worst person in the world. And seeing how these characters react to different situations, and better still, how characters react to you, is just so much fun. Now, I'm not gonna lie, Rue's story did take a little while for me to get invested, but when things begin to ramp up in this game, I was pretty much hooked in until the end. But the funny thing is that even in Rue's story, Mint is such a strong personality and presence that she kinda ends up stealing the show. And when you begin to play Mint's story, you begin to realize she's even more of a psychopath than she lets on, because you've now got access to her inner monologues, which just add so much depth to an already amazing character. Of course though, beyond our protagonist, we also have an amazing cast of side characters that all manage to win your heart along the way too. You've got Belle and Duke, who basically play the Team Rocket role throughout the game and each have their own individual rivalries with our protagonists. There's also a bit where Duke dresses up as a star and becomes a character called Starlight Duke. And let me tell you, there are a few things I love more on this earth than Starlight Duke. There's also the lone weaponsmith Rod, who has a big bow, luscious red hair, and a heart of gold. But better yet, he's also got a cute puppy named Johnny Wolf, who oftentimes likes to walk into the frame of certain camera shots. There's also Fancy Mel, who has these little cat friends following her around. That's pretty cool. Honestly, I could probably sit here for a while listing off the various characters and why they're really cool, but you should experience them all for yourself. And considering the game's relatively short length, Square have managed to cram so much life and personality into each of these characters that you kind of end up missing them by the time the credits roll. The villains here are also excellent, by the way, although unfortunately it's kind of hard to talk too much about them without spoiling the story, but I will say their writing motivations and story arcs managed to live up to the standards of the rest of the game easily. Honestly, I was kind of taken aback by how much I enjoyed this game's plot. You can kind of tell it was made for a younger audience, but the writing is just so sharp and witty and manages to cover some really heavy topics and themes without ever feeling like it was dumbed down for kids. It's no Xenogears, sure, but it's a surprisingly heartfelt and human tale at its core, one that I think will strike a chord with anyone, no matter your age. And speaking of striking a chord, holy moly, can we talk about this presentation? You want to talk about Squaresoft Excellence, all you need to do is look at or listen to this game to see that these guys were simply operating on another level during the PS1 days. The character models, enemies and bosses all look super clean with tons of little details, which thankfully the many in-game cutscenes give us plenty of opportunities to appreciate. The framing of these cutscenes as well is particularly good, something Squaresoft often liked to play around with during this era. and once again is used to great effect here. The environments here are similarly varied and detailed throughout the game. Now, there's only about 10 or so unique environments outside of the town of Corona to visit, with one area exclusive to each of the characters, the Ghost Temple for Rue and the Gamor Forest for Mint. And while some of these environments definitely shine brighter than others, I'm Looking at you, Mel's Altelier. This is simply a gorgeous game visually from top to bottom, showing once again that whether it was 2D, 3D, or a combination of both, when it came to the PlayStation, Squaresoft knew how to work some magic. Although even with the lovely story, great characters, and beautiful visuals, it really is the music that ties the whole thing together with a lovely little bow. It's the kind of soundtrack you know is gonna be special from the very second you walk into the first action stage. As I said before, this is the first time that I've played this game, but immediately the music felt warm and nostalgic. It has the traits and instrumentation of many Squaresoft games of that era, but there's this sort of ancient, otherworldly quality to the whole thing that can heighten the emotions during cutscenes or have you bopping your head along to the combat. It doesn't matter where you go, who you're talking to, or what you're doing in this game. It keeps managing to introduce new and memorable pieces of music at almost every single step. Here, have a listen to a small sample and see for yourself.
The composer for this game, a man named Junya Nakano, would later go on to assist Nobuo Uematsu in the Final Fantasy X soundtrack, but considering how good his solo work in this game is, I find it amazing that he never went on to compose another game by himself. It's really a huge, huge shame. In fact, if you look at the roster of people responsible for this game at Square, we've got people who worked on the lights of Seiken Densetsu, Chrono Trigger, and Xenogears, to name but a few, and you can really sense the talent and ambition behind this game, and it probably comes as no surprise that these devs would later go on to influence series like Final Fantasy, Xenoblade, and Kingdom Hearts, to name but a few, which really does leave Treads of Fate as this sort of standalone experiment in the middle, a once-off that isn't part of a bigger Square series like Final Fantasy, the Saga games, or Mana series. It's just a cool, charming, and incredibly memorable once-off that, while certainly not Square's best or most polished effort gameplay-wise, is certainly, at least I think, one of their shining gems of the PS1 era, if just for the wonderful characters and presentation alone. It's a game I think any player of any age and skill level will enjoy, and considering the fact that a playthrough with each character should only take you about 8-10 to 10 hours apiece, well it's a game that also doesn't outstay its welcome and can be reasonably beaten without eating up too much of your life. Look I love 40 plus hour games as much as the next guy but I've got the attention span of a lemon and get distracted by my cats about 20 times a day so you know these midland games are really the best of both worlds. So if you're looking for that warm cozy hug that only a PS1 era Squaresoft game can provide there are few cozier than Treads of Faith or a uh, Dew Prism. Even both its names are kinda cool. It really does have it all. Well ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna about do it for volume 13 of obscure and forgotten PS1 games, a volume full of many highs and also many lows, but also a volume with a cute dog, which I think we can agree is the most important thing. We checked out a cool Euro tank game that lets you race to Acid House on the Moon, a game that's probably included in a list of things prohibited by the Geneva Convention, a game that answers the question, what if Resident Evil, but you dunk on robots? And finally, one of the many reasons why I'm convinced Squaresoft had a vendetta against me and my pals from the PAL region for quite a long time. Definitely some interesting games here for sure, but what would I rate them based on this arbitrary scale that changes colour each episode? Were any of the games must plays? Maybe worth trying if you like the look of them? Perhaps they were just kinda meh? Or worst of all, do they belong in the trash destined for a life of eternal obscurity? Well, out of volume 13 selection, we see Is No Good living up to its name and ending up in the trash tier, Tank Racer and Hard Edge slotting comfortably into Tri tier, and Squaresoft coming in hot with another top shelf game to add to the most play pile. Is No Good is quite simply one of the worst platformers I have ever played. Not every platformer is perfect, sure, but even some of the rougher ones can still have some redeeming features that make them worth at least a cursory glance, but Is No Good manages to botch pretty much everything imaginable in this game, from the movement to the hit detection and pretty much everything in between. The game's only saving grace is the odd catchy music track or colourful environment, but really deep down inside, this is just a miserable experience from start to finish, and you should probably avoid it. Tank Racer, on the other hand, a nice combination of high-octane explosive racing fun and only the odd bit of misery thanks to the game's brutal AI. It's a game that has its issues, sure, and I suppose the tanks here aren't very, uh tanky, but it still delivers on a lot of the promise and expectation that you'd have from a game simply titled Tank Racer. Running over cars, blasting other tanks with your turret, and ruining people's barns. It's the stuff that we love to see. Plus the racing and controls, while still pretty much that of a standard PS1 racer, manages to feel both great to play and unique to this particular game. If you've got the patience to deal with its high difficulty and unpredictable AI, well it should offer up a few hours of fun at least. Plus it's a Euro racer, so you know, the soundtrack's a banger. And speaking of good soundtracks, Hard Edge is another game I enjoyed quite a bit. It doesn't really do much to expand on the static background tank control game formula other than simplifying things a little bit, giving you four swappable characters, and adding beat-em-up gameplay into the mix. But hey, the beat-em-up gameplay manages to be pretty fun at least, and 
That's impressive in itself. While it won't win over any genre naysayers, I think the combination of good graphics, cool setting, likeable characters, fun music, and most importantly of all, that sweet, sweet bad video game voice acting should make it worth popping into your PlayStation at least once to check it out. And finally, we have Treads of Faith, a game that I had never played before, but one that has quickly become one of my favorites on the console, just down to how memorable and charming an experience it is from start to finish. Now look, admittedly its gameplay isn't the most refined or exciting of Square's output on the console, but the cool melding of beat-em-up platformer and RPG gameplay tries more than enough cool things to keep it engaging throughout, but beyond that, it's the game's beautiful presentation, gorgeous soundtrack, and lovable characters that really turn this into a must-play in my book. It features some of the funniest and best written dialogue in any Square game from that era and honestly I can't imagine anybody trying this game and coming away with a bad experience. I'm sure there's a lot of you out there who are very well acquainted with this game but if you've yet to try this out or simply just didn't know it existed because you live in the PAL region, well now you know. Seriously folks, a life without mint is a life not lived. Anyway, that's about it for yet another volume of obscure and forgotten PS1 games, but before we finish up, we gotta give a shout out to those who submitted their games for today's volume. Container Core and Forever Craig for Tank Racer, Acidonia 150 Reborn for Is No Good, KM and Larry Kowaska are combined first ever two-time winners for picking Hard Edge, aka Trag, and finally High Retro Game Lord and RJ Mario 22 for picking Treads of Faith. Thank you so much for your submissions, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. And don't forget, if you want to submit your pick, you still have until volume 20 to troll yours into the comments. So don't delay, it's only going to take about a year or two until we get there. And that's like a few weeks and dog years, so you better get on it. And of course, I'd like to give a big thank you and shout out to my lovely Patreon subscribers who help make these videos possible, including fine folks like Adot Lad, Alan Castlin, Crimson Cyclist, Dave Nolan, Doma, Globe99, Kyle Winter, Moomatron, Moomin Biscuit, Trans Rights Are Human Rights, Mr. The Joshman, Richard Kramer, and Spectre117 who have all subscribed at the Fan++ Plus Plus tier. And finally, a big thank you to you for watching this video. I'll be back real soon with some more videos about video games, but until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll talk to you again real soon. See ya!